Okay, thanks. Please be quiet. We're going to start. So, uh, welcome back. So, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Max Welling for this talk, uh, keynote talk. Uh, Max is a professor at the University of Amsterdam, and he was previously uh, serving as a vice president of technology at Qualcomm, and he so recently started a lab at Microsoft Research. Of course, Max is very well known for his many contributions to machine learning from theory to more practical aspects. And today he's going to talk about the interface between uh, machine learning and quantum mechanics. So, uh, Max, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I wanted to highlight uh, basically the fact that uh, I represent, I'm in the board of ALICE, uh, European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems. Very happy to see that uh, the Ellis unit in Paris has uh, sponsored uh, this particular uh, event. Um, and I hope that if that more of that will happen, more mobility, more exchanges between students and faculty across Europe will happen. If you have any questions about Ellis, uh, feel free to send me, uh, send me an email. I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking today actually about two topics. Um, one is the topic, I think, of the person who will come after me, which is, uh, uh, you know, topography and uh, neural uh, uh, sort of at least inspired stru uh, structures. And the second half of the talk is going to be on quantum uh, neural networks. So these are my collaborators, uh, Andy Keller, who is a student in MLab and in, uh, in Borsch Delta Lab, and Roberto Bondeson um, is an employee at Qualcomm. The overview, as I said, of the talk is, uh, first I'll be talking about equivariance, which is in, you know, introducing symmetries into neural networks. I will then talk about um, how to unsupervised learn uh, approximate symmetries into neural networks, which is something that people haven't done before. People mostly hard code uh, symmetries into neural networks using uh, mathematics, representation theory. Um, then, um, and I'll, I'll try to make the connection with, uh, with topography, which is uh, apparent um, in the brain. Um, then I'll transition from there, uh, there is a somewhat natural transition, turns out, to uh, quantum neural networks. And in fact, um, I'll be announcing the discovery of the Hinton particle, which is an elementary particle that, will, that is inside your neural net. Of course, that is a joke. It's not a real particle, but at least mathematically, you can actually identify it, you can define it. Um, and then uh, finally, I will, uh, I will conclude. So the first part is about uh, equivariance. Now, um, by the way, this talk has a lot less equations than what I've seen so far. I apologize, maybe this audience expects lots of, lots of equations. This is, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, all extremely sloppy, but I'm going to tell you. I hope you can bear with me. And just for the purpose that I saw so many equations towards the quantum part, I just, in the last hour, in injected some more equations uh, into, the, uh, into the presentation. Um, but for now, it's going to be somewhat at a higher level. Um, so what are symmetries and why are they important in physics, first of all? Um, symmetries are a unifying principle in which you can write equations about things which were formerly thought to be different phenomena, like electricity and magnetism, into one set of equations which looks exactly the same for every observer. And that um, trick, basically, this idea of making sure that everybody writes the same equations, every observer writes the same equations, um, sort of the first step was, uh, I guess, rotations, um, and then came Lorentz boosts, which is basically mo for different observers which have different speeds relative to each other. And then surprisingly, you know, electricity and magnetism became one and a single thing. In, in, in particular, an observer which sees an electric field is observed by somebody else who flies by the electric field with a constant speed as a magnetic field. That was taken one step further by um, Einstein, who said, well, if we can do constant velocity frames, why not also do accelerated frames? And then um, if, you, if you do that, you figure out that in fact, 
um, one observer who is accelerated the experiences a force, um, and that force is indistinguishable from a gravitational force by which he equated the two. And so now things which were again considered different, namely acceleration and gravity, were equated to be one and the same thing. And so again, this is a highly unifying uh, sort of effort uh, on physics. And of course, all, as we know, all of general relativity basically follows from that single observation. And also, you know, the whole standard model with all its particles uh, in, 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 there were many, many more particles uh, before the standard model was written like this, um, were, uh, is organized according to symmetry groups. So there is uh, three groups, U1, SU2, and SU3, um, and they, the particles, uh, the leptons, and the bosons, they are organized according to, 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 they are form representations under these groups, and in fact, you can transform sort of one particle into another particle by using one of these symmetry groups. So um, it's an extremely powerful idea. I, 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 it has to remind me of a quote that I made a picture in the beginning. Somebody said uh, that a, a French researcher, old researcher said, the, there's only symmetries, um, and except for there's also construction symmetries, which basically proves the point. I thought this was a beautiful, um, a quote that I'm going to use because in some sense that's also what we followed here. We basically said well it's such a strong organizing principle we should be able to use that also in deep learning. Um, and uh, basically the idea um, is, and it's shown in this picture by the way, these pictures are made by uh, Maurice Weiler who is a student in my group um, and who has written a 200 page uh, sort of introduction if you want to this whole field, and if you really like an introduction that's beautifully, beautifully illustrated, actually with a lot of good math in it, um, then I invite you to, to read that paper by Maurice Weiler. Um, so the idea is that, um, so let's say you want to analyze the signal on some manifold. It, you know, we, of course, mostly we think about two-dimensional flat planes like images or one-dimensional signals like audio signals. Um, but, you know, you could be interested in weather patterns on the Earth, in which case you would be looking at a sphere, or maybe, you know, in this case, we were interested um, in an egg. And we were in interested in trying to, uh, you know, analyze, let's say, the signal, which would be where is the gecko, or segment out of the gecko um, on the egg. Okay, so you could sort of formally think about, you know, some signal processing tool which would analyze the signal that's defined on this egg, let's say it's a visual signal, there's pixels on this egg, let's say, and that would be some, for, some kind of convolution, let's call it sort of loosely some kind of convolution, a filtering of the input by which you would get this image. Okay, so now we do a symmetry transformation, this is, we start again from the original image, we do a symmetry transformation which is rotate the egg, right, now the gecko of course moved, and then we do again exactly the same convolution, same operation, same parameters, etc. and we get this uh, output here. Now, equivariance is basically the statement that this diagram commutes. In other words, that if I would actually, you know, do the, the rotation on this filtered image, I would also get to this particular output. Now, it turns out that if you use this, um, and in a neural net, I should say, I'm, I'm sort of assuming you know something about neural nets, but in a neural net, uh, you have an input, which would be the image, or the, and then you would process it into sort of hidden layers. In these hidden layers, you aim to represent, to, to define representations of the input um, that, for instance, start to extract abstract properties um, of this input. It could be, at the very deep layers, there could be neurons or groups of neurons which define, let's say, the presence of an object or the relationship with another object um, and there could also be neurons which encode for the orientation of the object, for instance. Now, how do we organize these representations, these feature fields, as you can call them, in such a way that they... Um, it is interesting indeed, yeah. So that um, if, you, uh, if you transform, let's say, your input, that also the representations that are deep into your neural network also transform in a very regular way. And we call this encapsulation. So Jeff Hinton wrote a paper a while ago where he defined capsules, and capsules turn out to basically be the irreducible or in, in more generally representations 
um, of the input um, in, in sort of defined in these hidden layers. Now we have already mentioned that this works fine on manifolds um, and the advantages of doing such a thing are data efficiency because you can imagine that for instance for pure translations um, it doesn't matter you know if you want to identify a cat it doesn't matter whether the cat is on the left hand side of the image or on the right hand side of the image if you have just one filter and you apply the filter everywhere the same filter everywhere you'll just get a nice equivariant output um, but you only need the pr number of parameters that is equal to the size of that filter that's different from having a filter which analyzes the whole image at once because then you need many many more parameters so this is very data efficient um, you uh, the other thing is that in these capsules we try to decompose um, the presence of the object and the pose of the object now pose is defined very generally it could be any transformation it could be a light lighting angle or it could be the actual pose of an object uh, it could be the position of an object it could be ge geometrical or non-geometrical um, and it turns out also, I think, in the brain that these pathways, they sort of split. There is a pathway that, or there's neurons that encode for the presence of something that is invariant to pose and all sorts of other, you know, factors um, that might be there. And then there is also neurons which actually represent the pose and other properties um, of the object. And the final thing is that this is actually useful because the next layer will have an easier time analyzing the layer before. So in neural networks, we try to analyze things sort of sequentially through layers. And as we go deeper in the neural network, the top layers, um, they want to be increasingly abstract, uh, abstract in the sense that there are neurons that encode for your grandmother, for instance. And in the beginning, these are, these are for instance, uh, edge detectors, much more low level things. Now, um, but if, if you can imagine that if you just translate the input and then you get a complete permutation of all your pixels in the next layer, the next pattern recognizer, which is sitting on top of it, will have a very hard time figuring out what's going on below. Where if you have a pattern that just nicely shifts with the input that shifts, then I just need to have an, another detector up here, which also d is equivariant and shifts, um, in order to detect the, the, you know, and the patterns below and maybe combine these things into more abstract things. So we started this, uh, this research in 2016 with Taco Cohen, who is a key figure in this field, uh, and uh, Sandra Dieleman at, at DeepMind also had a paper at the same time, same conference. Now, um, if, if, uh, if you are thinking now, okay, this looks uh, complicated, I want basically, is there a software tool for me to start working with this? And uh, it turns out there is this very nice paper that Mark Finzi a stu student of Andrew, Andrew Wilson in NYU wrote, um, and that is a paper on a very simple way to construct in software these representations, these, these filters that are completely um, sort of equivariant. And, um, and basically what you have to put in, you have to, you have to know the generators of the group, um, and you have to know the representations of between the two layers, so the representation of the input layer and the representation of the output layer. These are the things that you stick in, and then you push the button, and then you'll get a full kern a, a, a sort of a, a full kernel matrix of all the possible uh, a basis, let's say, of all the possible kernels uh, that you could use. And then you can define linear combinations of those things, and those are also still equivariant. And for instance, uh, we did this for the rubrics cube group which is uh, close to, uh, you know, 10 to the 20 elements, which is, of course, humongous. And previous methods obviously could not deal with that number, um, but it only has six generators. And so since we only need generators as the input, we can simply actually extract uh, the, um, the, the, the basis uh, filters. Okay, so we also worked on gauge CNN. So, so this is basically, it's somewhat different, um, but people call it sort of local symmetries. Um, and um, the, te the technology, the equivariance technology, um, can also be applied precisely this, to this problem. Um, and so here the problem is, let's say, you're on a Möbius strip and you're trying to define a uh, sort of a convolutional operator on this sort of manifold, which has strange topology. Now you start with some filter, and then you have to decide how to move that filter to other positions, right? And you can do this by parallel transport, for instance. Now the problem is, of course, if you go around, we all know that the, the filter will have mirrored itself. 
right? So you arrive here and then suddenly this thing has mirrored itself. So what it basically means is that the, the filter orientation um, depends, or in this case, the, um, it's not the orientation, but the, I guess, I don't know what you call it, but the, sort of the, the mirrors, the, 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 the parity, okay, the parity. The, the parity of that filter depends on the path you took, because if you, if you went from here to here, it would have a different orientation if you would loop around the Mobius strip. Of course, the same thing happens on a sphere if you move this way and then up, or if you parallel transport this way, you will also find different orientations. It basically means it's very hard to define a global frame. Um, often you have a topological you know, obstruction uh, to define this, this global frame. And uh, the way to solve it, as everybody knows uh, who does mathematics on, on, on these kind of Riemannian sort of manifolds, is that you do not try to define a global frame, you try to define many local frames on patches, and then you just tell, you just have a rule of how one frame connects to the other frame, right? Now that's exactly what we did, you know, the transformation between two frames, for instance, on a sphere is a rotation, a two-dimensional SO2 transformation, and basically it means that you will have to define your kernels, if you want to do deep learning on a sphere, you will have to define your kernels to be equivariant, the same equivariance as I talked before, but now under SO2. Okay, um, so that's the introductional part. Um, now I'll jump to basically a problem that, you know, we tried to solve. So, in, so the first thing we did was say, okay, let's say we have the actual mathematics for this group. Um, now can we bake it into the neural network? And so for that, you will need to know uh, the theory of representations for that group. Now we know it of course for uh, many uh, groups thanks to mathematicians like SO3 um, we know very well, SON we know very well, all, all these things we can do but what if there's very exotic transformations that may be not even a group, it may be a semi-group, it, it may be something very weird that not even a mathematician has written down but it's somehow in the data. Um, can we still learn uh, representations inside our neural networks that transform, that sort of have this approximate property that they behave in a certain structured way under these transformations. And um, so let's first go into a little detail on what precisely I mean when I say a capsule and what I mean uh, by equivariance. Okay, so let's say I have an input image which is an upright image um, um, I think it's the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> um, here. And, um, and then what we do is we define um, detectors. In this case, we have an eye detector and a mouth detector. Of course, in general, there's many more. And um, we then define also rotated copies of that detector. So we have an eye, but we have also an eye, let's say, rotated over uh, 45, uh, 90 degrees uh, copies, but you could, of course, define many more uh, sort of rotations if you want. And you can also do ir irreducible representations, in which case you can define arbitrary orientations. And there's a mouse detector. So in this case, um, you will find that the, these detectors, they fire here and here, right? And these, these detectors are all silent, or this part of the capsule. So this is one capsule, this is an eye capsule, this is a mouth capsule, and this part is silent. Okay, so then I rotate the input. Now what's happening is two things. So first of all, the detections rotate, as you can see here, the orientation has changed between these two. But also I've moved, I've sort of cyclically permuted in these capsules one notch to the right. I've gone from here to here. So that's the transformation on my latent representation. And we say that this diagram now commutes. So it, basically what I want to say is that whatever we do in our latent representations, this operation does not have to be the same as, the, as what we do on our image space. Okay, so we define this to be a capsule here. Now it turns out that in the brain, um, and also in, in machine learning in the 90s, people studied this topic actually quite a bit. And, um, but in, in a very different context. They didn't think about equivariance or symmetry groups. They thought about uh, you know, topographic um, maps, and they were trying to explain them. For instance, here is a orientation maps in the brain, and they, they create this beautiful topographic uh, sort of structure. Um, now, how could it be, people ask, that brains actually, you know, create these kinds of things? And uh, the reason people thought about it then was statistical independence. The brain tries to 
create an efficient code. And an efficient code means that the, that the neurons fire almost independently of each other. They are not highly correlated because that would be independent. You could still compress it if you do that. And one way to do it was to do independent component analysis, but then it turned out there's also higher order dependencies still present, which I will explain in a minute. And to reduce those, you know, people thought, you know, you need topographic organization. Okay, so here's these higher order dependencies. So this is a, a wavelet decomposition um, on the left here. Um, and of course, if you look at this, these, these are the basically the hidden neurons firing, which are basically the coefficients of the multi-scale uh, sort of wavelet decomposition. And what you see is that there is still structure. This doesn't look like white noise. Um, it, it is pretty hard for every pixel to, to predict whether it's going to be black or white. It looks like some kind of uh, uh, sort of salt and pepper noise. However, we do see that in certain regions, the activation energy is certainly higher and is clustered. Now, the same thing you'll see in stock prices. If you look at stock prices, you look at the returns, which is the difference between two stocks. Um, then also you see that the volatility clusters. So this is a very general phenomenon in natural image statistics. And so the idea is to, to model that by looking, so the idea is then to look at your neighbors, to remove that type of dependency. You look at your neighbors and then you say, okay, take the average activation of all your neighbors and, and divide your activation by the average activation of your neighbors. That way you Gaussianize your activation more and you become more independent. Now we proposed in 2018 or 2015 actually, we proposed to use this as a new definition of uh, disentangling. So there's a lot of terms that float around in this field. Um, one of them is disentangling and it's really not very well defined what it means, but there's some intuitive meaning which means that neurons code for sort of uh, different types of things like objects or relations or maybe neurons are statistically independent. Um, here we proposed that disentangling basically means that the neuro hidden neurons are organized in these capsules. So this means a capsule, the total activation of this capsule codes for the presence of an object and the detailed uh, sort of activation inside this capsule codes for the pose of the object. So um, what I need to do is to introduce this concept, which is a variational autoencoder, which is a neural network, because that's what we're going to use when we are defining these, these variational autoencoders. Uh, sorry, when we uh, look at this topographic VAEs, um, and these topographic VAEs are going to capsulize symmetries. Okay, so the idea is that we have some latent representation Z, uh, unobserved, we may have some other you know, class labels. We send it to a neural network, we call this a decoder and we generate, let's say, an image. So this is the actual data generating process, or the forward model. There's also a backward or an inverse model, which we call the encoder, where we take an input, and we also send it through a neural network to then predict this, the states of these latent variables. This is what we think of as a normal neural network. And these two things should sort of work together um, in order to you know, train both of these together in a kind of expectation maximization sense. So, so this one and this one are each other's inverses, or they learn to become each other inverses. Okay, the topographic VAE. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to define two sets of variables, Z variables and U variables. So maybe it's easier to look at this. I mean, I'm not so equation oriented, so I like to look at pictures, so, but uh, you know, up to you where you want to look here. But um, let me point here. So we have a capsule. In these capsules is a bunch of variables. And there's two types of variables inside each capsule. There is basically the variable which codes for, uh, which is as independent as possible, which is Z. Um, you can think of it as maybe coding for the object presence or something. And then there is these U variables, which are uh, energies or you know, act total activations. You see that we square them, so we only are interested in their absolute value. They don't, we don't look at their sign. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pool these, these activations of a neighborhood. So we just think there's a neighborhood, you look at your neighbors, and we basically pool all the information from your neighbors into you know, one term, and that's this one over square root w u squared. Now w is basically just you know, averaging over your neighbors. 
We multiply that pointwise with the z variable, and then we get a student t variable. Student t variable has much ha heavier tails, and uh, the student t we can use to define the sort of the topography. Okay, so the um, the encoder for a VAE in this case has two terms. The first term predicts the z variable. The other term predicts the variance variable u. Um, and they are both given by neural networks of this kind. So we take an input x, we define a mean, we take an input x, we define a sigma, and then uh, there's a neural network for the variables z and u. That's the encoder. And then the decoder, so I just defined this thing here on this side. And then the decoder is this thing here, where I create my t variable, which is here, the t variable from my z and my u. Then I push it through a neural net g to then sample x, which is my observation. And then uh, you have to know the field a little bit, but then there is what's called, uh, actually we had a talk about this. We had a talk on, uh, on divergences. So this is basically also a KL divergence between the true posterior and the approximate posterior, where Q is the approximate posterior and P, and the true posterior is given by the inverse of this P. And you minimize that, it's called, also called an elbow, evidence lower bound. You minimize that over both Q and P um, to, to learn your model. Okay, so that's the half, first half of the story. With this, you can actually already get uh, these types of topographic pictures. That's only because you're only spatially reasoning. But that's not really what, in my opinion, the inductive bias that we humans use in order to, you know, train, in, you know, to create intelligence or to, to train um, sort of our, our, our brain. And what I think is a very strong prior is that um, when I stand in a room, when I do things in, in life, the abstract things do not change very quickly, right? If I, you know, it's something, in a, something could happen, I could move my head or the lights could suddenly, you know, got dark. However, I'm pretty sure that the next second you're still all there, right? And the, and the room is still exactly the same, even though the input on my senses is the same. So there is a very slow change in the more abstract objects in the world. And that's the type of um, inductive bias that we would like to use. Okay, so how are we going to do that? It, this, it's a very similar idea. So again, we have our t variables. Um, but now instead of averaging over your spatial neighbors, we are also going to average over our temporal neighbors. So it becomes a space-time capsule, which is where you, uh, the u variables also look at things in the future and the past. Well, you cannot really look at the future, but you could, let's say, also only look at the past, or, or if the future was already there, you can, you can also incorporate the future a little bit, and you average over those things. Now, what you like to correlate is the, the future, one time step in the future, so a, a, it's hard to explain, so a particular pixel now, here, should be correlated with the, with the pixel one step to the right, but also one step up in time. So in other words, you sort of, you, you, you move along the light cone, if you want, with a certain speed, right? And you would like that, this, that you correlate things both in, by moving with a certain speed, both, you know, delta a change in x, but also changed in t. And so we call this the roll operation. So the roll operation sort of correlates, you know, the capsules uh, a little bit in the future and in space. So maybe this picture is more clear. So we have an input sequence. In this case, we both rotate and change color. So these are two operations, two transformations. Uh, we have our encoder, which, which actually uh, predicts our capsule. So here's one capsule and here's another capsule. We have these, so these, these are activations for Z. We also have activations for U, which are also organized in these capsules. We now average uh, the U capsules squared but we average this one with this one where we actually sort of rotate permute inside the capsule by one time slot. And we average this guy by looking at two time slots in the past and this by one time slot in the future and this by two time slots in the future. Okay, so this is our representation. And then if we want to go to the future, we just start rolling all our representations forward, right? So we have a representation defined. Now, if I want to predict the future, I'm just going to roll activations as they are here forward I mean basically around these capsule dimensions and if I do that then I can start to predict the future um, 
image that might appear. Now, of course, you can think that learning happens by uh, just predicting the future and seeing if the future is actually what you think it is. And if, it is, if it's correct, then do nothing. If it's wrong, uh, update your model. Okay, so here's some results. Um, you know, here we have, uh, these are most beautiful. So these are scale changes and it's this grayed out area that we haven't ever seen. So this is what we're trying to, to predict. The top line is ground truth. The bottom line is what we predict. So we can, we can beautifully predict color changes here, scale changes. You can see that there's sort of an abrupt change. So it has a big bit of trouble, but it can do it. And then here's rotational changes. And just because they're so beautiful, um, we have created a whole lot more for you to enjoy, um, but it's basically all the same thing. Okay, um, so now in the last part of my talk, I want to connect to quantum mechanics. Um, so basically what we've done so far is we forged an explicit link between redundancy reduction, between topography, between equivariance and symmetries, and disentangling. And we have constructed these capsules that learn in an unsupervised way how to organize input in terms of presence, the presence of objects and the pose of those objects. Um, we have basically learned that, um, okay, and, and all these, uh, these capsules transform equivariantly, which means that by, by, let's say, if you want to rotate an object, you just, you know, do this permutation inside your capsule. Um, we use object constant, constancy that the world around us doesn't change very fast, even though the input on our senses changes, can change very quickly. Um, so the representation is disentangled in the sense that I discussed before. Um, and now maybe the picture that we want to have in our mind is each one of these capsules, I think of it basically as some kind of oscillator. It's, it's something that just moves around at a certain speed, right? And uh, if certain things are not present, then it's not moving around and that capsule is not activated. There's no activations in the capsule. But if I just move my head like this, I just think there's all, all these capsules in my head that are rotating around and that are trying to sort of, they, they, they get, try to predict the future. Think of that as a field of oscillators. Okay, and um, now the next step is to go to quantum oscillators. And be, but before I do that, I want to first say a few words about the continuum limit of deep learning. Um, it's a particular interpretation of deep learning as a partial differential equation. So when we write down deep learning networks, we write them down on a regular grid, like an image on a regular grid. That's actually not a very robust way of defining it because we all know that, you know, that the, image, the, the, the pixels on the grid are not fundamental. What is fundamental is a continuous signal that we are sort of sampling at a certain sampling rate. And we do it regularly, but what if I would have completely changed the, the grid into something different, I would still want my neural network to work, right? I don't want it to completely fail. So current neural networks completely fail. So what I want to do is I want to define it then in the continuum limit as a, as a PDE. So we're gonna write the function F. So F is a image, uh, X is pixel space, let's say, or you know, the continuous space, and T is the depth of my neural network. And I'm gonna write down an ODE, order, or ordinary differential equations, or a PDE in this case, for this field F of XT. I'm going to have a differential operator D, uh, which is basically you know, linear combinations of operators and higher order operators, uh, d d derivatives, sorry. And then of course the formal solution of this can be written like this, which is actually, you know, you can write that as a, as a kind of convolution, right, with a, with a Green's function. Now, uh, to put that all in a, in a neural network, you know, the first step is to say, okay, how do we go from a irregular set of pixels to a continuous signal. And for that, we use a Gaussian process regression model. Um, so a Gaussian process is basically, you know, you fit a mean function as well as a, as a standard deviation around that function. Um, and um, yeah, so that's defined basically as a, as a stochastic process. Um, so the first step is to take your discretized pixels and turn them into a Gaussian process with mean and variance functions. Then we define this operator A, which basically defines the PDE, which moves forward, which is now actually defined on this Gaussian process, uh, which, which moves forward, which diffuses and, and, uh, and shifts basically this input um, to the next layer, 
Um, we do a nonlinearity, which is actually a challenge because you know these nonlinearities they uh, they make your life hard if you want to learn and things. But we define some nonlinearity. We project back onto something that we can treat as a Gaussian process, and we repeat and we backpropagate to learn all that. Okay, so it turns so in, in order to make the jump to quantum mechanics, um, of course the thing is that in quantum mechanics this equation is uh, almost precisely mirrored by the Schrodinger equation. Right? So in the Schrodinger equation, we have an input image, which is our, our wave function at time zero. And we also write down a PDE where the derivative of our wave function psi you know, moves according to a Hamiltonian H, which is an operator with, you know, with uh, differentials and, and, and potentials and stuff like that. Of course, there's this annoying I, which changes everything. But anyway, uh, it looks formally, it looks a lot like this. And in fact, you can also formally write down the solution in a very similar way. Now, because this I, of course, things actually are much more like waves um, than you have for an or ordinary uh, PDE. Um, and then we, we interpret the probability of an event happening as this absolute value psi squared. Now, the point is that, of course, uh, how do I interpret this in this picture? Well, it basically says, what's the probability that I find some particle? If I ask, uh, where's the particle? then this is my probability distribution for where to find the particle. And then I, you know, when I do a measurement, you know, there, I'll find it there with that probability. The problem is, of course, that that's not an image. It has nothing to do with an image, right? We, we want something that says, if I do a measurement, what image do I see? And so we really need something different. And what we need is much more like a quantum field theory rather than ordinary quantum mechanics. So we have a classical field, which is basically on pixels we have defined uh, feature values. Now we're going to define a quantum field where we have oscillators at every point. Um, you can think of these maybe as these capsules, but that's sort of in my fantasy more than anything real. But these are oscillators that are moving up and down. They have a position and they have a, in the y direction, I should say. They have a position in the y direction and they have a speed in the y direction. So they sort of move around here. And of course, they also have a position in the x direction on the grid. Okay, so now we move to basically uh, the previous talk. So in the previous talk, um, the speaker talked about Gaussian states, and we, this is exactly what we will use as well, Gaussian states. Um, the, we make a transition from the, quant from the Gaussian process that I just defined to the quantum Gaussian process. Um, and uh, yeah, so it basically means you have to introduce, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but you have to introduce operators and you have to introduce quantum states, obviously, and momentum va variables. Then we define linear operators on these, on these uh, Gaussian states. Um, those are well known in optics already. Um, and for instance, these symplectic transformations that the previous speaker talked about is, is one part of the, uh, you know, one part of a linear operator that you can use. There you can also shift things. So basically what you do is you take a Gaussian blob and you move the Gaussian blob into some direction and you rotate it and you squeeze it. Those are the things that you can basically do to your Gaussian blob. Um, and then, of course, we, in a neural network, that's not enough. We also need nonlinearities. And so we actually defined a new nonlinearity, which looks a lot like a ReLU, which then turns this Gaussian state into a non-Gaussian state. And in, in principle, you can think of that as a Wigner function, uh, which can get negative at places, right? So it is, it is now a much more general object and also, of course, much harder to work with. By the way, when you start doing that, you can not simulate anything reasonably in your classical computer anymore. You will have to then move to uh, quantum computers that are not yet there. Um, but anyway, you, you can, of course, write down the math. Okay, so then uh, I, I promised some equations. So here are my equations, my contribution to, uh, to the equations of today. So we have um, our field of oscillators. Um, so the phi is basically the position in this direction and it's defined at a position x. We'll treat x discrete for now. Uh, you can take the continuum limit, but we all know in quantum field theory, this is not easy and you get into infinities and all these kinds of things. So we don't want to go there. We just d define a discrete set of uh, points here. Um, and we have these phi, phi fields, which is basically the vertical position as these things uh, sort of move up and down. Now in quantum mechanics, the easiest way for me to understand quantum mechanics is to think of it as the square root of a probability distribution. So um, 
When you write down a state, the, say a particle is somewhere, or these uh, particular uh, set of balls are in a particular state, that is a classical state. Um, but we are quite comfortable with, right, with thinking about that, about probability distributions over all possible states. Right? We can write down P of phi, and then that's an object over all possible states that I want to entertain. Now in quantum mechanics, uh, and the only thing that's really different is that you look at sort of the square root of that in some sense. So in, you, you look at these states and you say, instead of normalizing these under the L1 norm, which is sort of P probabilities are positive and they have to sum to one, you say these things are normalized under the L2 norm, which is that you know, they, they sum to one if you square them. And they can be complex too, but then of course, you know, that you, you, do, you, do, you use that norm in a complex space. That's really the biggest change. I mean, a superposition, I mean, a superposition you can have in a probability space too, right? If you, if it's, it's, it's quite similar. Now for quantum field theory, we have to sort of upgrade, we have to define operators phi, which act on, on these states. So here's a state basically, which is a linear superposition of all possible states phi. So um, we have to define an operator on phi, so we basically say, you know, this cat is going to be phi x times psi of phi. And we also have to define an operator uh, which measures the momentum or the, the velocity, if you want, which is the derivative operator d d phi x of phi, right? And so if this is a field, you know, I guess people are here are very familiar with, you know, operators acting on the fields and then basically using the derivative to get the velocity field. Okay, and um, so I think of this as basically a bunch of oscillators, um, but these oscillators are also connected, right? So the, this oscillator and the next one next to you is actually connected and they interact. And um, so, yeah, so let's go to the next page. So here are then the Gaussian states. This is directly from our paper, but this is a perfect mirror of the previous talk. So you all know this already, that's good. So we, we first define basically this vector of, you know, configuration variables and uh, or, or operators and also uh, momentum operators they have a very nice symplectic form uh, you know these commutation relationships between these r's you know are given by, by ij ij which is given by the symplectic matrix uh, you can define the mean of this operator r and the, and the covariance of this operator r which was perfectly defined already in the previous talk so all this work was already done it's kind of nice um, and then there is this, this proposition, which was this discussed um, at length in the previous talk, which is C is symmetric, positive, definite. And there's this funny sort of uncertainty equation, which basically says that you cannot make C infinitely small because you would sort of violate Heisenberg's uncertainty um, relation. Okay, so then uh, we, we can define linear operators on these states. Uh, they were already discussed as well. So S is a symplectic matrix. Uh, you can write a matrix as a function of S, an operator defined as a function of S, like this. Um, and you can also have a shift operator. These have very beautiful, um, basically, commutation relationships. So D, D transpose R, D is basically shifting R. And W uh, dagger R, W um, is actually S times R. So you can see that this R, they behave like uh, vectors and, and matrices, uh, if you want. They, 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 R behaves like a vector uh, of operators, if you want. And from these uh, definitions, you can then define basically that D actually does shift the mean of the Gaussian state, and omega does sort of transform the Gaussian state by rotating and squeezing. So these are our linear operators on our Gaussian states. And then we need um, a quantum uh, deep neural network. So this is, the, I think we're almost there, two more slides. Um, so the quantum neural network basically is now, we have a linear unitary operator. So think of all possible states written out in a huge vector, exponentially long vector of all possible states. Um, then you write this massive matrix or operator which, which acts on that massive state. We have the linear operator, which is already discussed in the previous talk. Um, and actually known in optics as well, how to uh, sort of act on these states with lasers and stuff. Then there is a nonlinear unitary operator, which we defined. Uh, you do this L times, one for, one for each layer. Um, and then at the end, you do some pooling in order to finally make a prediction for a particular state. And this prediction 
is basically again sort of born born type rule computing uh, an inner product between two states um, to figure out what the probability is to find the system in a particular state and you can do this by actually doing a physical measurement okay so I have linear operators here I have you know I I didn't go into it and I think I'm running out of time but so this is our definition of our nonlinear operator, and the beauty is that it will actually implement a soft plus on your operators. And this was not known before. And then there is this uh, this past, last one, which is pooling, an invertible pooling operation to define uh, basically our, your final uh, prediction. Okay, so that was the paper. If you want to read about it, uh, we call it the Hinton's in your neural network. Uh, Hinton, because you know Hinton is actually sort of a famous figure in our field who started the deep learning uh, sort of revolution, if you want. And um, we thought it was nice to, you know, to come up with a particle. And you can actually define that particle by now transforming these operators to, the, to these kind of creation and annihilation operators. And then you can actually formally define these as states in your system. Um, and, and, and Hinton is a boson, turns out. Um, and then, uh, so you can, and, and maybe the most exciting thing of all of this is that you can actually map this on a, on a quantum computer. So there's optical quantum computers um, that use lasers and uh, that work uh, with a, a continuous variable representation. Um, and this framework fits perfectly on that particular quantum computer. Of course, the quantum computer doesn't exist yet. I mean, you, I guess you could formally try things like that, but it will very quickly decohere and you will not find anything. You will certainly not be able to backpropagate it in a meaningful way. Um, but we've looked at sort of classical limits and semi-classical limits, and we can train this, and it works. It's unclear what it would mean if there is an actual quantum computer around. So then to conclude, um, so we talked about equivariance, topographic VAEs, unsupervised learning of equivariates, capsules, oscillators, quantum field theory, and quantum computing, and then finally the Hinton particle. I personally find it extremely fascinating that we all think about probability distributions in AI where nature actually chose a, quite a different framework. It chooses quantum mechanics. It is pretty close to dealing with probability distributions, but it's different. Of course, you have interference effects and you have these funny bell inequalities and things. It feels like it is a reasonable thing to study, even in AI. Um, I think of deep neural networks in a very similar way as I think about physics. It is a massive information processing machine. Right? We are at one slice in the world, there's information on this slice, and we progress this information to the next slice. How does that you know, happen? In a neural network, it's precisely the same. You know, we, we, can, we can describe this with PDEs, uh, we can describe this quantum mechanics, it's very, very similar. Of course, in a, in, a, in, a, in a deep learning, you have a very specific task. The task is to, uh, is to, to, you, to detect the objects, let's say, in the environment. And I don't think that's the task of nature. Nature just moves us forward using laws of nature. Um, but th but that's we can learn something like that by backpropagating and learning it to do certain tasks. Um, and the final thing is I think in, at least in my field, machine learning, we need to start to learn the language of quantum mechanics. I think here already many people have, you know, in mathematics, people have started to look at quantum mechanics much more deeply. Um, and, we, and I think it is a wide open field um, to use quantum mechanics in deep learning. And the reason is that in 10 years, there will be full tolerant quantum computers. And it would be very nice you know, to learn quantum mechanics now and develop algorithms uh, for the time that these quantum computers are going to be around. And I'll end there. Thank you. So we have time for questions, and I will ask, please, for those who are in this room to come forward to ask the question, because there are a lot of people on Zoom, actually, like 50 people, so it would be much better. And for those who are upstairs, I will repeat the question. So in quantum mechanics, we, we have, the, of course, the domain of mechanics with physical constants and so on. Here, uh, what is the scale uh, for the formalism? Of course, it's a kind of quantum formalism, but you must have, uh, to some extent, a scale which, uh, which is going to play the role of uh, the Planck constant and so on. Yeah, so in fact, the way we develop this is like all the scales from physics. So 
because we want to implement this on a quantum computer, we do need to ab abide by the laws of physics, which means that I didn't write all the H bars and all these kinds of things in there, but there are H bars there, um, like you would write down for any physics equation. Okay. No, because the H bar depends on uh, just uh, it's a dimension. It's a dimension. It's an action. Yeah. That means it's uh, it's for instance a momentum times uh, a length. Yeah. But here you don't have this kind of dimensions. Physical um, dimensions. Yeah. So, okay. So you're basically asking, could we generalize this by not, but maybe, you know, forgetting about these dimensions and, and really treating it as a statistical theory where we can sort of play around. That's an interesting idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I, whether that will give something more as a statistical theory, I think is, is wide open. I don't know. Um, so here we basically developed it really as a physical system because we want this to, you know, the reason we did it is that we want this to run on a quantum computer. So we really have to use the constants of physics. But well, the suggestion is interesting to see if we can go beyond it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So other questions also in the Zoom, if you can pose the question on. Yes. So the and then Daniel after. So thank you for your introduction to your work. I have a question whether, um, again, quantum mechanics, right? Uh, does, do your methods give you a suggestion how to treat uh, complex data, data that comes in complex, uh, in complex field? Yeah. Oh, a complex input, you mean? Yes. Um, actually, this, this should be simple, I think, for, for I mean, in, in some sense, because we have to first map the input to a quantum state, right? And so you can, you can, uh, I mean, I, I guess you could s s use two bits in some sense for... Yeah, for that, that's the easy way, but quantum mechanics treats the complex field as, as something different. It's yeah. The mathematics of the complex field is different. So someday, if you're really going to do quantum computing, somehow dealing with complex data would be a nice step using the fact that you're not just as really imaginary. Yeah. And yeah, so it's interesting. So uh, we haven't thought about it because we were always thinking about real data, right? We think about images and, sp and speech. Um, and so we thought about how to map that as an input to a, to a quantum computer, but we didn't think about... I, I think it should be easy because in some sense the input to the neural network, to the quantum neural network should be a quantum state. So it you, you should, I mean, almost be able to map it one to one your, your, your complex number to the, the actual complex state. But so in particular, like you mentioned, uh, there is superpositions, yeah. right? They're yeah. in the real world with complex yeah. data. Yeah, okay, but that's we can do. Yeah, yeah. so you should have yeah. it. Now, of course we do uh, superpositions, but actually my claim is that superpositions are not as special as we think, because when we talk about, let's say, a graphical model, and we talk about the probability distribution of something, right? Then we actually talk about the entire object of all possible states and assign probabilities to each one of the states. And we reason about these things. So we reason about, you know, what it means to the probability distribution if I see new evidence or you do probability or you do belief propagation, you know, what, what you know, we do belief updating in our state. So that is already reasoning at the level of all possible things we could ever encounter, not about one single state. So for me, in AI, we are already dealing with superpositions. We're just dealing with a different norm somehow, which means that we don't have uh, these kind of things like entanglement. Well, maybe also entanglement, but maybe not, you know, bell inequalities, clearly. Um, and and in interference, in more generally, is, is absent, right? You, you do not have interference um, if you have just positive probabilities. You really need a state, you know, say two, two, two particles, they split. Right, and then you have to come together. One has a positive, you know, quantum state. The one has actually a negative quantum state, and then they can really annihilate each other into zero. This is never possible in, in with probabilities because every every path has a probab positive probability, and they all add up. But in quantum, you can have a negative probability for a path for something to happen, and then they cancel. And that's very very special, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Daniel. Yes, my question was about the type of dynamic for learning you get. 
in that. Okay? Because if you look, for example, uh, supervised uh, learning, yeah. okay, uh, the gradient depends on the, on the state. Okay? Yeah. Also. Oh, yeah. So, so this is a, a complicated question that it didn't go into. But we can learn things on a classical computer, obviously. But we have to make approximations to what we do with our nonlinearity. So we basically have a hierarchy here of the nonlinearity. We can basically define classical nonlinearity, which are basically push forwards of uh, in input measures to the neural net. We can do semi-classical things and, and fully quantum things. Now, the issue is that when we do classical things and we make some approximations after we do the nonlinearities, we can, which basically are based on the central limit theorem, we can perfectly learn these systems, no problem. We've done it, we can learn on MNIST, on images, actually on fairly reasonably sized images, which is also new. Um, but obviously when things become truly quantum mechanical, you cannot you know, uh, simulate them on a, on a, on a, on a normal computer, not, not even a forward pass, mm. let alone a, a backward sort of learning pass. Thank you. Thank you. So if there's any other questions for Max? Okay, so I think we can uh, thank Max for his talk.